हेलो एंड गुड मॉर्निंग गाइस गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन एंड प्लीज कंफर्म इफ आई एम ऑडिबल एंड विजिबल टू यू प्लीज कंफर्म इफ आई एम ऑडिबल एंड विजिबल टू यू गुड मॉर्निंग वेलकम 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 एवरीवन गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन गुड मॉर्निंग ऋषभ गुड मॉर्निंग दीप्तेश गुड मॉर्निंग शरण गुड मॉर्निंग मस्क गुड मॉर्निंग हरमीत सिंह गुड मॉर्निंग इशिता अनंता मेघा कीर्ति मानव खेड़ा धारणी मानसी मानव गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग थैंक्स फॉर द कम कंफर्मेशन सुम्मी गोस्वामी ओके ग्रेट गाइस गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन एंड यस टुडे आर टू ऑस्पिशियस फेस्टिवल्स ऑफ द कंट्री वन इज ईद टुडे इज वन ऑफ द बिगेस्ट फेस्टिवल्स व्हिच इज ईद सो ईद मुबारक टू ऑल ऑफ यू and second is akshay tritiya akshay tritiya is one of the biggest festivals of hindus and yes today is akshay tritiya so both the festivals very very auspicious festivals before starting our session let me enlighten enlighten you about these two festivals which are there number one is um undoubtedly eid eid um uh, is is uh, you know a uh, uh, festival which uh, uh, signifies prosperity which signifies effort so you know 30 days of fasting uh, you know dedicated towards god comes to uh, fruit comes comes to its um, sweet end today so uh, that is the significance of eid and akshay tritiya it is it is it is uh, of paramount importance also because whatever work whatever good deed is done on akshay tritiya it became it becomes um, uh, you know uh, uh, it becomes forever so if you donate something on akshay tritiya it will become forever if you study on akshay tritiya it will become forever so yes both the festivals are very very auspicious for uh, both um, uh, muslims and hindus so guys beautiful beautiful day to start capital gain part 3 today and you guys are live today on eid on akshay tritiya you know you could you could have easily told me sir today is eid we are on off today we won't study today you could have easily told me this but no you are live this is testimony of the fact that you are definitely serious about your june 2022 examination so many congratulations for this spirit you know in my eyes you are already cm inter qualified or final qualified students right you just have to have the degree um uh, from the institute you just have to have the mark sheet with the institute by having this good gesture that yes today even on a holiday you are present in good number in this live session is a testimony of the fact that you are damn serious about your june 2022 examination and yes you are going to rock your june 2022 examination so many congratulations on that particular aspect once again eid mubarak and happy akshay tritiya to all of you with that note let me start one of the most important and critical topics of our syllabus which is capital gains so guys we already have discussed in the last two lectures the basics of capital gains and then some critical provisions of capital gains we have already discussed the um, uh, fundamentals of capital gains and many provisions we have discussed in our earlier sessions so yes till esops we have covered the capital gains today we are going to continue beyond esops so in the last session we have covered the taxability of esops yes sir so in this particular session we are going to continue beyond esops okay this is the table which i had um uh, you know done in the last uh, live session if you have not attended the first two live sessions guys please attend the first two live sessions and then watch this live session it will be much more useful to you it will be much more understandable for you okay so esops is done guys so today we are going to start the first capital gain implication that we are going to start today is capital gain implication in case of rights issue or rights entitlement this is a very very critical topic of your syllabus guys and um, you know for from an exam standpoint um, it doesn't usually uh, come in the examination in past examination it doesn't usually come it it comes rarely but yes if it comes it is such a simple topic that you will be able to um, uh, comprehend it well and attempt it and you will be able to score good marks so don't leave this topic these small small topics which are there in Uh, your syllabus uh, you know they can be asked in the examination in section a b uh, in very short note type questions and even in uh, a little uh, medium type uh, sized questions so yes rights issue and rights entitlement so first of all let's understand what do you mean by 
rights issue and rights entitlement and by the way these two are different words rights issue is a different word rights entitlement is a different word so both of them have different set of taxability so i'll first explain the meaning of rights issue rights entitlement and then we are going to delve into the computation of capital gain um on sale of these rights issue or right entitlement all right so guys what happens is if you are shareholder of a particular company then you get certain rights what are the rights rights are that you know um, whenever company is in need of funds instead of asking for funds from a third party they would definitely prefer their own investors their own existing shareholders to invest money uh, further money in them whenever company needs money the existing shareholders would um, you know come up and extend offer to um, uh, extend money to the existing shareholders so that is the existing um uh, shareholders help towards the company and the company issues rights to shares to such shareholders so whenever existing shareholders of the company these are existing shareholders uh, shareholders of the company whenever the existing shareholders of the company are offered some shares some new shares in the company this is known as rights issue the benefit of the existing shareholder is that existing shareholder will get the shares at a price which is less than the market value of the shares that is the benefit which existing shareholders will have and the benefit which company will have is that company need not spend huge amount in um, uh, you know uh, publicizing about the public issue uh, making people aware about the public issue etc etc they will you know uh, with with brief complexities will brief formalities they can actually um, raise the funds through their internal shareholders itself that is the benefit to the company and the shareholders are also benefited why because they get shares worth higher amount at a lower amount at a concessional amount from their a company so each of the shareholder suppose is uh, uh, given a right of three additional shares so in this chart you can see each of the shareholder there are three shareholders of the company three of them get right to subscribe to three more share at a very very concessional or a nominal price now guys please note that this is a right and not an obligation which means that if shareholder wants it can renounce this right it can say no i don't want these shares yes that is also very much possible so there are two things okay one is right entitlement what is right entitlement right entitlement means when shareholders become entitled to take the additional share that is known as right entitlement please note that the shareholder has shareholder has not subscribed to the new shares as yet he has just been given the right when you give the shareholder a right that is known as right entitlement when the shareholder actually chooses to subscribe to the rights then this right entitlements get converted into rights shares so there are two stages to it stage number 1 when the right entitlement is given to the um, uh, shareholder when the shareholder is given the right to subscribe to new shares of the company right that is known as right entitlement and when the shareholder actually decides to um, purchase the rights to actually subscribe to the shares of the company that is known as rights issue now sometimes if the shareholder is not willing to subscribe to the rights issue if he is not willing to take up the additional shares of the company then he can renounce his right in favor of some other person so there's an external party okay there's an external party that external party is requesting this shareholder to give the right to subscribe to new shares to him because he also wanted to subscribe to the shares <clears throat> the existing shareholder will say okay you please take my right right so i'll give you a, 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 a an example in which i'll talk about some numbers also because numbers are very very important over here so i'll talk about some numbers also okay suppose the shares are quoted in the market at 120 rupees the company gives right to the existing shareholders to take the new shares of the company at say rupees 100 per share the share is quoted in the market at 120 rupees per share the company offers these share, additional shares uh, of the company to the existing shareholders at what price at rupees 100 per share that is the right entitlement which is given to the shareholder now shareholder will actually uh, uh, will ha either have to subscribe to this right or has to renounce this right when shareholder is renouncing this right then if there is a third party who is willing to actually take this particular right 
shareholder can transfer his right to the third party. Now the question is, at what price will the shareholder transfer this right to the third party? Guys, most likely the shareholder is going to transfer this right to the third party at rupees 20. So third party has to pay rupees 100 to the company, right? 20 rupees is the benefit which the third party will get, but this benefit actually belongs to the shareholder, the existing shareholder. Because of the existing shareholder, this particular um, a share is available at a reduced price, right? So ideally, this particular um, uh, you know right should be transferred to the third party at rupees 20. So the third party should pay 20 rupees to the shareholders and 100 rupees to the company to get shares of the company. Now, guys, depending upon the uh, you know, demand supply, depending upon certain other factors, this 20 rupees is negotiable. Yes, this 20 rupees can be 18. The new shareholder can tell the existing shareholder that look, Mr. Existing shareholder, there's no benefit if I buy this at 20 rupees from you. At least give me some benefit that I'm buying this share from you. At least give me some benefit. So there can be a bargain. There can be a negotiation. And depending upon the negotiation, demand, supply, market conditions, etc., etc., there are various factors. This 20 rupees can be a lower price as well. That is known as rights entitlement. So, there are two options which are available to the existing shareholders. Option number one, option number one, existing shareholders may subscribe to the shares of the new com of the uh, existing company, the new shares of the existing company, the shareholder may subscribe to the shares. And option number two is that the shareholders may renounce the share, may, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, may uh, uh, wave off their right to take the additional shares in favor of some other person. Some other person will take the shares on behalf of the existing shareholders. Renouncement is also possible. So when the shareholders convert their shares, their rights entitlement to rights shares, then taxability with respect to rights issue arises. Then taxability with respect to rights issue arises. But if the shareholders sells off their rights entitlement, if the shareholder sells off their rights entitlement, then guys, taxability is a little different. That is how taxability varies in case of rights issue separately and rights entitlement separately. Guys, no need to copy these uh, diagrams. This I will be sharing on the WhatsApp group where you are already a part of. If you are not part of the WhatsApp group, then join the WhatsApp group. All these charts and diagrams I will be sharing on the WhatsApp group in PDF format. All right. Now let's come on to the capital gain which will accrue on this particular transaction. Now guys, Rights shares. Okay, first let's talk about rights shares. When rights shares are received by the existing shareholders, at the time of receipt of rights share, of course the existing shareholder has to pay something to the company, right? Now imagine a situation that the existing shareholders has uh, subscribed to the rights share. In the future, in the future, after two years or three years down the line, these rights shares will be sold by the existing shareholders to a third party. At that point in time, when this rights issue shares are being sold by the shareholder to a third party, what will be the capital gain implication? That is what we are going to discuss in this particular chart. So when the rights issue or rights entitlement shares are sold off in market, at that point in time, what is the capital gain implica implication? That is the uh, uh, point of uh, learning in this particular part. Okay. What will be the sales consideration? Guys, it will be as usual. Whatever is received by the existing shareholders on selling of these rights to shares, that will be the sales consideration or rights entitlement. That will be the sales consideration. That will be the sales consideration. Whatever is received is the sales consideration. Now comes the most important point. What will be the cost of acquisition? What will be the cost of acquisition of rights shares as well as rights entitlement? So if the rights shares are sold, if the rights shares are sold, rights shares are the shares which are subscribed by the existing shareholders, uh, the new shares which are offered to the existing shareholders. If they are subscribed by the existing shareholders, that gets converted into rights shares. Okay. So if rights shares are um, under question and cost of acquisition is to be computed, then the rights issue price. So in our example, 100 rupees was required to be paid in terms of rights issue. So this 100 rupee will become the cost of acquisition in case the rights shares are sold tomorrow in market. So rights issue price is the cost of acquisition in case rights shares are sold. Now, in case 
the shareholder doesn't subscribe to the right shares okay he says no i don't want any right shares i will renounce my right entitlement in favor of someone else so the sales consideration will be the rights entitlement price which is paid by that someone else to the existing shareholders the question is what will be the cost of acquisition guys very very carefully please understand this point that cost of acquisition in this case is nil there is no cost of acquisition which you have incurred to uh, having been entitled to this rights entitlement it's just a right entitlement it is just a right which is being given to you you have not paid anything for this particular right so the cost of acquisition in case of rights entitlement it becomes nil cost of acquisition in case of rights shares it becomes rights issue price very minute difference very minute difference between rights issue and right entitlement and therefore the difference in treatment of their cost of acquisition also accrues and arises so cost of acquisition is different for rights shares it's different for different for rights entitlement now sir since when will the period of holding be counted yes that's an important point since when will the period of holding be counted so guys in case of rights shares in case of rights shares since when the period of holding will be counted from the date of allotment of shares whenever the rights shares were allotted to the um, existing shareholders since that particular date the period of uh, 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 entitlement the period of holding should be counted so in case of rights entitlement what should be the period of holding in case of right entitlement the period of holding should be counted from the date when the rights were declared from the date when rights were declared so guys declaration of right date will always precede the allotment of shares date this date will be afterwards this date will be before okay so this date will always precede this date will be um uh, before this date declaration of right comes first allotment of share comes second so in case you have subscribed to the shares and have taken rights sh shares then your period of holding will be counted from the date when your shares are allotted to you but if you have not subscribed to the shares and you have sold your entitlement to someone else right in that situation your period of holding will start from declaration of right whenever the company had declared the right in this share whenever the company has declared the additional right entitlement of every shareholder since that date the uh, the um, uh, period of holding should be counted so guys the catch is the catch is the catch is very simple difference between rights issue and right entitlement that is the biggest catch okay if you are able to appreciate the difference between rights issue and rights entitlement that is um, uh, the 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 bottom of the um, uh, story that is the bottom of the problem and if you have been able to resolve that you will be able to easily learn this section very very well because it's all depends on logic it all depends on um, uh, common sense the the only moot point of consideration over here is that you need to understand the difference between rights entitlement and rights issue so yes i have been able to uh, in detail talk about the difference between these two words in this particular concept all right next is a, again a, a little complicated just like rights entitlement etc etc a little complicated topic that i'm going to touch base next guys there's something called corporatization of recognized stock exchange before coming on to the uh, main description or the main content let me tell you where i am going to why i am discussing this topic okay so i need to discuss a topic guys the topic name is capital gain of transfer of equity shares <laughs> allotted at the time of corporatization of recognized stock exchange this is the topic which i need to discuss with you what is the capital gain implication if we transfer the equity shares which are acquired at the time of corporatization of recognized stock exchange this is the topic which i need to discuss with you now to discuss this topic i first need to um uh, discuss what do you mean by corporatization of recognized stock exchange and therefore before i come on to this topic i'm going to first have a slight discussion on what do you mean by corporatization of recognized stock exchange what is this concept of corporatization of recognized stock exchange first we need to discuss this and then we are going to actually uh, delve into the implication the direct tax implications of this particular concept all right guys so please listen to me carefully corporatization of recognized stock exchanges 
what do you mean by stock exchanges stock exchanges stock exchanges are a place where shares or financial instruments of companies are traded are bought or sell so the buyers and sellers meet at a particular place and at that particular place the price of the shares or the financial instruments are determined and based on that price which are determined the uh, uh, shares are being sold or purchased that is known as stock exchange now it is a very very big business especially in a developing country like india why only a developing company even in de de developed countries uh, even in western world this is a very very big occupation because people are very much interested in buying and um, uh, selling securities of big companies and gaining some benefit out of it right this is a very big business around the world stock exchanges right in india bombay stock exchange is a very very powerful stock exchange and it has got um you know several 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 subscribers and several members who are working day night to facilitate this transaction of sale and purchase of shares stocks securities etc etc now let's go back to the history of stock exchanges okay we'll go back to the history of stock exchanges okay in earlier days the stock exchanges were formed in way of body of individuals so there were two or more individuals who joined hands and they used to open a stock exchange earlier days okay i'm talking about the history or as a society there was a society registration act 1860 according to the society's registration act stock exchanges used to be a society or a normal body of individual okay now if if these forms of structure were there which were there earlier stock exchanges were in the form of body of individuals or some were created in form of societies it was very difficult for government of india to regulate stock exchanges and yes stock exchanges determine the fortune of crores and crores of individuals around the globe but it was difficult for government of india to control such stock exchanges because of their form they were unstructured right body of individual is a unstructured way of doing business okay it is unstructured government of india could not regulate um, uh, such uh, organizations such uh, stock exchanges earlier so mandatorily government of india asked each of the stock exchange to convert themselves into company they required each of the stock exchange uh, uh, in the entire country to convert themselves into companies what is the benefit if they convert themselves into companies what is the benefit the benefit is that government of india will be able to better control such stock exchanges using laws regulations etc rules will be there bylaws will be there and using those bylaws using those rules government of india will be able to regulate stock exchanges in a very very strong manner which was need of the hour because guys many individual used to lose their hard earned money because of the mal practices which used to uh, be there in the stock exchanges so this particular concept of corporatization comes from that event where government of india forced all the stock exchanges to get themselves converted into companies therefore the term is corporatization corporatization which means we are moving towards uncorporated form to a corporated form we are moving towards an uncorporated form to a corporate form to a company form we are moving stock exchanges from body of individuals to companies from societies to companies this is known as corporatization of stock exchanges now guys naturally if there is some conversion then naturally the assets which were earlier held by the society the rights which the members had in the society the rights which members had in the body of individual when it was a body of individual had to be converted or transferred to company right so guys members had two kinds of rights what were the two kinds of rights two kinds of rights is shares members used to have shares in the uh, unrecognized form of stock exchanges and they used to have the trading rights or membership rights these were the two things which member had in the erstwhile form of uh, the recognized stock exchange so this is the erstwhile form right aop boi society but not a corporate this got transferred to this got taken over into stock exchanges which was a body corporate incorporated under companies act right now guys this taking over of the erstwhile form to a new form meant transfer of two kinds of assets number one shares 
in the original form and share doesn't mean equity shares okay share means shares in profit of aopboi society share means share in the respective ownership right those shares were transferred to the companies and transfer of trading rights or membership rights which were earlier there in the society aopbi that were transferred to stock exchanges now guys this transfer was exempt under section 4713a government of india told uh, such stock exchanges that okay stock exchanges um, this transfer is not a transfer which you are doing this transfer is a transfer which we are asking you to do this is not a transfer which you are doing for gaining some benefit for gaining some profit etc uh, but this is a transfer which we are asking you to do and hence we are exempting this transfer from capital gains so guys the existing shareholders of aop surrendered their right in aop and they got shares of the body corporate this was the transaction which happened let me reiterate the existing shareholders of aop surrendered their right in aop and they got the shares of the companies this is the transaction which happened now in this particular transaction where the existing um, share was dropped and new shares were uh, given to the members in this particular transaction this transfer of um a uh, share from uh, aop to company was exempt from tax government of india said okay we will not take any um uh, capital gain tax from you we are exempting this particular transaction from tax now the question is of course sir this transaction is exempt from tax but what if what if the shares which are held by the members in the company are subsequently sold by this members to a third party this is very much possible guys this is very much possible right so the member had share in aop right his share were transferred in company that transfer is exempt from tax no capital gain i agree but what will happen when the member who has share in this recognized stock exchange will transfer this share to a third party what will happen then will that capital gain also be uh, exempt answer is no that will not be exempt no that will not be exempt then how would that capital gain be taxed that is the question which we are going to answer in this particular section so please note please note the transfer from here to here is exempt from transfer is not uh, eligible for capital gain the transfer from here to here is not eligible for capital gains it is exempt under section 47 13a but the transfer from here to a third party will be excisable to capital gains and we are talking about this particular transfer in this particular section if you understood this basic then guys you will be able to understand the section pretty easily and pretty well okay now let's read the heading once again the heading says capital gain on transfer of equity shares allotted at the time of corporatization of recognized stock exchange so whatever shares were allotted at the time of corporatization of recognized stock exchange th those shares if they are transferred to a third party if they are transferred to someone else then what will be the capital gain tax implication that is what we are going to compute now all right this is the chart which shows you the capital gain computation which will happen in this particular case how would sales consideration be arrived at how would cost of acquisition be arrived at everything is written in this particular chart so let's see all right what will be the sales consideration guys sales consideration will be as usual as usual means the sales consideration um, uh, you know uh, whatever is received on selling of those shares that will be the sales consideration so it will be as usual sales consideration has no catch in it we will um, uh, take the money which we have received from the person whom we are selling these shares to that will be the sales consideration now what will be the cost of acquisition this is the biggest catch in this particular session what will be the cost of acquisition sir we got the membership rights we got the equity shares in the company free of cost right we got it free of cost because government of india told us to convert into a company we converted into a company and we got the shares free of cost there was no cost of acquisition no guys no there was a cost of acquisition let's read in case of shares of the company of recognized stock exchange the cost of acquisition is cost of acquisition of the original membership oh so guys the cost of acquisition of this share is equal to the cost of acquisition which you had paid 
to buy the original membership which is originally was there in AOP, BOI or any other society. So the cost of acquisition of these shares will be equal to the cost of acquisition of the original shares. That is the principle and that is a very, very important principle. Obviously, guys, you got these shares for free. These you got for free. It was thus in a scheme of corporatization that they got transferred into this. You got this for free. There was no price which you paid for this. So this is free. But there is a cost of acquisition, cost of acquisition of these shares. That will be taken as the cost of acquisition of these shares when you are selling it to a third party. So it says cost of acquisition of shares is cost of acquisition of the original membership. Now there's another thing. There's another thing is membership rights. So along with the shares, you are also getting a membership rights. But guys, the cost of membership you have already added as cost of acquisition of shares. So over here, you will add nil. So cost of acquisition of membership rights will be nil. Being a member of that particular stock exchange, you are paying some uh, fees. So that particular um, cost of acquisition will be nil because you have already added the cost of acquisition of original membership over here. So membership right membership right cost of acquisition will be nil then what will be the period of holding guys the period of holding will start from the date of original membership whenever you have got the original membership whenever you have received the original membership then you will um, get the period of holding from and indexation benefit will be from allotment of shares guys in case of merger also we had seen this thing that you know the uh, income tax department will give you certain benefit and will withdraw certain benefits both the things will happen parallelly okay so the indexation benefit will arise since the time when you had acquired the shares in this particular recognized stock exchange uh, incorporated as company. The indexation benefit will be given from this particular period. But period of holding will be taken from the original shares. Whenever the original shares were held, period of holding will be taken from those original shares. That is the difference. And this same difference is there in merger section also. Same difference is there in amalgamation, which I had um, uh, uh, made you revise in class two. Please see the live session two. If you have not seen live session two, please see the live session two. In live session two, I had discussed this particular part in great detail that the indexation benefit will be given from the date when the asset was acquired, the original asset was acquired. Period of holding will be taken from the date when it was taken in the original share, in the original um, form whenever it was taken. Period of holding will be taken from that particular date. <clears throat> okay, sir. Got it. So, yes, this was corporatization of stock exchanges. Ah, now let us move on to a dhakar provision. This is known as dhakar provision or dabang provision. A very, very important provision of this particular chapter. And before we move any further, guys. Hit a like button on this video. Let's target 1000 likes on this particular video. Let's hit like button of, on this particular video. And yes, do share this video with your friends. It will prove to be very, very, very useful for all the CMA intermediate and final students because I've specifically covered the transactions which are given in CMA study material. So it's very, very important for CMA students. All right. A strong provision of very, very um, uh, you know, in-depth provision and yes, a little complicated one also. You have studied merger provision. You have studied amalgamation provision. You have studied conversion of shares, preference shares into equity provision. All that you have studied in the second um, uh, revision lecture. Continuing that, that particular series, this is another form, form of reconstruction of business, which is known as demerger. Now, first of all, before coming on to the capital gain tax implication of demerger, let me make you understand what do you mean by demerger? What is the implication of demerger? Guys, demerger means when a particular company gets split into two parts. Merger means when two companies are coming together. Amalgamation means when two companies are coming together. But demerger means when one company is getting split into two parts. I'll give you a simple example, okay? X Limited is the original company. It has two units, Unit X and Unit Y, which are independent of each other. Okay. Unit X is manufacturing something. Unit Y is manufacturing something else. They are two independent units. Both of them are part of X Limited. Now, one fine day, X Limited thinks that X Limited should focus entirely on Unit X. It should not divulge its energies or its attention span to Unit Y. So what it does is, 
it siphons off unit Y to a different company. That company is known as the resulting company. The company which was originally formed uh, is X Limited. That is known as the demerged company. Earlier, X Limited had two units, unit X and unit Y. Now, X Limited only has one unit, unit X. Where is unit Y? Unit Y has been siphoned off or has been demerged to another company by the name of Y Limited. This company is having unit Y. So unit X, unit Y gets split and unit X is in, in a company which is X Limited. Unit Y is in a company which is Y Limited. So both of the units are split into two different companies, demerged company and the resulting company. This is concept is known as the concept of demerger. Where there are two companies, where two companies are uh, splitting that is known as D merger. Now, <clears throat> guys, the question is the existing shareholders of X Limited, the existing shareholders of X Limited, right? They might want to subscribe to shareholders of shares of Y Limited. So, Y Limited shareholders, who are Y Limited shareholders? Y Limited shareholders might be some new shareholders or some of the existing shareholders of the X Limited company would become the shareholders of Y Limited. They might become the shareholders of Y Limited after split off. So now there are two set of companies, X Limited and Y Limited. Y Limited has not been made by fresh infusion of capital. There is no fresh infusion of capital which has happened in Y Limited, but Y Limited has been made only by dissecting or splitting up the existing assets of X Limited. So all the assets and liabilities of unit Y have been transferred to Y Limited. Now the question is, the shareholders of Y Limited, whenever they in the future go to market and sell off their shares in Y Limited, what will be the cost of acquisition of those shares of Y Limited? Let me repeat guys, let me repeat. I know a complicated section. I know a, 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 a difficult section. You will take some time to absorb it because it's difficult. It's not that easy. Please, I'm very much with you on this fact that these provisions of capital gains are definitely not easy. I'm with you on that. But slowly and steadily, you will be able to absorb them because you've already done merger section. You've already done amalgamation section. You've already done um, uh, the conversion of equity shares into uh, preference shares into equity share section. You've already done these big sections. Okay. This is a slightly bigger section than those sections. But if your fundamentals of those sections are clear, your this section will also be absolutely clear. All right. Now, guys, two companies are created Y Limited and X Limited, right? I want to sell shares of Y Limited. I am a shareholder of Y Limited. And now I want to sell the shares of Y Limited. So the question is uh, what will be the various parameters for selling shares of Y Limited. Now, my first question is, what will be the cost of acquisition of Y Limited's shares? What will be the cost of acquisition of Y Limited's shares? Sir, free of cost. Why free of cost? Because Mr. A was earlier the shareholder of X Limited. Now he was transferred to Y Limited as the shareholder of Y Limited. So, so X, Mr. A, Mr. A was given the shares of Y Limited free of cost. Mr. Y, Mr. Um, A did not pay anything. Mr. A received the share of Y Limited free of cost because Y Limited was given the assets and liabilities of Y Unit free of cost. So Y Limited had to issue its entire subscribe its entire share capital to Mr. A free of cost. It's a barter exchange. It's sort of a barter where the X Limited transferred assets of uh, unit Y to Y Limited. Y Limited gave the equity shares to Mr. A. It's a barter. Now, Mr. A has equity shares of Y Limited. Now, the question is, what will be the cost of acquisition of Y Limited? The answer is cost of acquisition of X Limited's shares. So, guys, Mr. A had to, uh, you know, pay something to purchase X Limited shares. What was that something? So, cost of acquisition of X Limited shares multiplied by Book value of Y Limited's asset divided by net worth of X Limited before D merger. Please understand this complicated provision. Please understand this complicated provision. I'll take some numbers, guys, and you'll be amply clear how this thing has arrived. Okay. Now, old X Limited. Old X Limited. Net worth of old X Limited is say rupees 100. Net worth of old X Limited is say rupees 100. Now, 
यूनिट एक्स होल्ड्स 40 ऑफ बुक वैल्यू ऑफ द टोटल कंपनी टोटल बुक वैल्यू 40 इज हेल्ड बाय यूनिट एक्स ऑफ टोटल बुक वैल्यू 60 इज हेल्ड बाय यूनिट वाई ऑफ टोटल बुक वैल्यू 60 इज हेल्ड बाय यूनिट वाई द बुक वैल्यू ऑफ द असेट्स एंड 40 इज हेल्ड बाय यूनिट एक्स नाउ माय क्वेश्चन इज व्हेन यू हैव ट्रांसफर्ड ऑल द असेट्स ऑफ यूनिट वाई इनटू वाई लिमिटेड व्हाट विल बी द प्राइस ऑफ शेयर ऑफ वाई लिमिटेड द प्राइस ऑफ शेयर ऑफ वाई लिमिटेड विल बी कॉस्ट ऑफ एक्विजिशन ऑफ एक्स लिमिटेड शेयर्स सो व्हाटएवर मिस्टर ए हैड टू पे to buy the shares of x limited shares and mind you at that point in time when mr a had purchased the original shares of x limited at that point in time unit x and unit y were together with x limited now only unit y is with y limited and we are asking for price of y limited shares so the simple formula is so simple formula is cost of acquisition of x limited shares what was the total cost of acquisition of x limited shares divided by net worth of total x limited multiplied by book value of y limited assets this will give me a pro rata value this will give me a pro rata value of the total cost of acquisition of x limited shares prorated to unit y what is the unit y proportion of total x limited shares which were purchased by mr a that is the pro rata which is given to me by this particular formula please read the formula very very clearly please read the formula very very clearly formula says cost of acquisition of x limited so what did a pay to buy the shares of x limited what did a pay divided by total net worth of x limited before demerger before demerger what was worth of x limited multiplied by worth of y limited assets what are the worth of y limited assets how much assets have been transferred by unit y to y limited that is in the numerator so in a pro rate way we are going to compute the proportion of this cost within y limited we are prorating this entire cost of acquisition within y limited that is how this formula is arrived <clears throat> now guys now please listen to my second question what should be what should be the cost of acquisition of x limited demerged company what should be the cost of acquisition of x limited demerged company guys this should be this should be cost of acquisition of original x limited minus cost of acquisition which you have just computed for y limited the remainder value the cost of acquisition of x limited so whatever you had com computed just now over here you subtract this value from the total cost of acquisition of x limited and you will get the remainder value which will be the cost of acquisition of x limited demerged company so yes guys i know it is difficult i am accepting this fact it is not straight forward but if you understand it using logic you will definitely be able to understand it well all right let's move on Let's move on to the second uh, aspect. Second aspect is uh, what will be the period of holding? What will be the period of holding? Period of holding of shares of Y Limited? Yes, sir. What is the period of holding? So, guys, period of holding is period of holding of Y Limited share. So, Y Limited share is the resulting company. What is the period of holding of Y Limited share? It will be period of holding of Y Limited share plus period of holding of X Limited share. So, benefit will be given to you since you hold the uh shares of x limited so period of holding of y limited shares is equal to period of holding of y limited shares plus period of holding of x limited share that the <clears throat> formula which is there okay sir last is uh, since when will the indexation benefit be there from the year of acquisition of shares of resulting company now i've already told you indexation benefit will always accrue from the year when uh, your current assets are acquired so indexation benefit will um, accrue from the date when y limited shares are acquired but the period of holding will start from the date when the original shares were purchased in x limited that is how period of holding will work so these are the two things which are similar to our demerger and merger provisions which were we have we had already studied okay sir now comes the uh, uh, the calculation of capital gain in case these shares are sold subsequently in case these shares are sold subsequently what is the capital gain competition in that particular case that is what we are going to uh, uh, endeavor now cost of acquisition of x limited shares post demerger is equal to cost of acquisition of x limited shares pre demerger 
So whatever was the cost of acquisition of these shares pre-demerger minus cost of acquisition of Y Limited shares, which we had just calculated using this formula, right? Prorate is to be done. When prorate is done, then the remainder value is of course X Limited value. Then period of holding of X Limited shares. Since when will the X Limited shares be held as um, uh, you know as as uh, uh, held by the assessee? It will be held since the time when the original shares were held. So period of holding of X limited original shares since the time of purchase will be taken as period of holding. Indexation benefit since when will the indexation benefit uh, be uh, accrue and arise? Guys, indexation benefit will arise arise uh, since the time when original shares were purchased. Because this and this is the same. This is this this is the same. There's no difference between the original company X limited and the X limited demerge company. There's no difference, right? So the uh, indexation benefit will accrue from this stage. However. In case of Y limited shares, the uh, indexation benefit will accrue from the date when the resulting company shares were allotted. That is a slight difference between the two. Okay, sir, got it. So yes, this was the provision of demerger, guys. Just go through this uh, particular chart carefully, and definitely you will be able to understand this um, uh, concept well. And uh, not not a very very difficult concept, but yes, it requires a fair bit of um, uh, revision. Okay. Uh, you have to re-revise this particular concept and then you'll be able to understand it well. Now we are going to come to a very, very important provision of your syllabus, not only for capital gains, but also for PGBP. This is very, very important. This is known as slump sale. This is known as slump sale. Now guys, till date, we had studied the capital gain implications of a plant and machinery or a piece of land and building or a piece of furniture or a piece of gold or a piece of some valuable asset right we have been able to only um, uh, understand the capital gain implication of uh, any particular um, uh, asset now we are going to understand the capital implication of selling a particular undertaking entire organization being sold as a whole we are not selling only one of the asset of a particular organization one share no, no, no. We are not selling any particular asset. We are sharing, sh selling the entire undertaking as a whole. Then what will be the capital gain implication? I will tell you the problems which will arise and then I'll tell you the solutions. Okay. First read the definition of what do you mean by slump sale? What is the definition of what do you mean by slump sale? So sale of one or more undertaking. What do you mean by undertaking? Undertaking means it's a group of assets which are capable of earning profits. So group of assets means it can be plant, it can be machinery, it can be furniture, it can be vehicle, it can be building, it can be land, it can be computer, it can be laptop, all pooled into one. That is known as an undertaking. So it's sale of an undertaking, one or more undertaking. It's a pool of assets which are being sold for a lump sum consideration. Now, please remember, I am not saying that I am selling my computer for 20,000 rupees, plant machinery for 40 lakhs, land and building for 80 lakhs. I am selling my uh, goodwill of so and so amount. I am not selling individual assets separately. I am cumulatively selling this entire undertaking for 2 crore rupees without assigning any particular value to a particular asset. Please note these words. Without assigning values to particular assets. I don't know how much plant and machinery is sold for. I don't know how much land and building is sold for. I don't know how much um, uh, my, my furniture is sold for. I don't know. I just know that entire pool of assets of this particular undertaking is being sold for 2 crore rupees. There is one lump sum consideration. There is one lump sum consideration. When there is one lump sum consideration, there is a pool of asset. How should, should I determine the cost of acquisition? How should I determine the period of holding? Guys, plant and machinery might have been purchased five years back. Furniture might have been purchased three years back. Some furniture might have been purchased six months back. Some plant machinery might have been purchased two months back. Some land and building might be purchased two months back. So every asset which is there in that pool has a different period of holding. What should be the period of holding? What should be the cost of acquisition of each and every asset? What should be the cost of acquisition? So when, we, when I'm selling it as a whole, how will I ascertain all these things? And how will I allocate the sales consideration to individual asset to find the individual capital gain? Those are the problems which arise in calculation of capital gain in case of slump sale.
and this particular section deals entirely with all those problems let's see what is the solution so competition of capital gain now the question is what will be the sales consideration of full value of consideration what will be the first figure of computing capital gain guys the first figure of computing capital gain will be the lump sum consideration received on sale so on sale whatever is the uh, uh, lump sum amount which is received that will be the sales consideration that will be the amount which will be the starting point of our computation fair enough fair enough okay 2 crores in our case okay 2 crores in our case we are selling the entire undertaking for 2 crores okay next will the indexation benefit be available answer is no indexation benefit is not available because usually all the assets which are there in this particular block will be depreciable assets so the uh, indexation benefit is not available in this particular case next what will be the cost of acquisition the cost of acquisition will be net worth of the undertaking now cost of acquisition guys will be the net worth of this particular undertaking that is a very very important point sir what do you mean by net worth what do you mean by net worth its calculation will be very very important guys based on simple logic book value of all the assets which are included minus book value of liabilities of this particular undertaking will tell us the net worth of this particular undertaking so in this particular case we are not taking only the book value of total assets we are also subtracting book value of liabilities from this particular um uh, from this particular book value of assets to get our net worth so the sale cost of acquisition will be net worth of the undertaking how will net worth be computed it will be computed using the book value of total assets minus book value of the liabilities and mind you effect of revaluation will be ignored if there's any effect for revaluation that will be ignored then a ca a chartered accountant report is required a chartered accountant certificate is uh, required specifying that yes the net worth which is computed is correct a ca certificate is required while doing this lump sum while doing this lump sum sale so yes the cost of acquisition which is a special point in this particular transaction that should be the net worth of the undertaking net worth of the undertaking is the cost of acquisition now last but not all the least what will be the nature of gain will will it be cap long term or short term will it be long term or short term guys there is a mix of uh, assets which are there in our block okay some asset was purchased when the undertaking was started some assets are purchased just now what should be the uh, nature of this particular sale long term or short term it will be mixed right it will be a khichdi so the answer is that since the time when undertaking was started that will be the relevant date of starting of period of holding irrespective of the fact that subsequently more assets were added and those assets might be short term those assets might be short term more assets were added to the block but they might be short term irrespective of this fact the undertaking start date will be seen so the undertaking when undertaking is held for 36 months or more the capital gain will be long term the capital gain will be long term if the undertaking is held for 36 months or more that is the nature of gain so these are the key points of consideration while you are calculating the capital gain in case of slump sale so yes a very very important point uh, a very very important uh, provision of our syllabus dikshit chopra as usual he has uh, 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 woken up late he has woken up at 10 o'clock guys he is a student who wakes up at 10 o'clock 11 o'clock 12 o'clock so he is a usual defaulter in coming to morning classes okay next is section 50 c absolutely absolutely i will share pdf of the entire capital gain on the whatsapp group okay i will share the entire capital gain pdf on the whatsapp group next section is 50 c 50 capital c now very very important uh, section guys uh, to curb some menace which, which which was created by people so guys what people used to do is you know in case of land and building especially in case of land and building when they used to sell land and building they used to um, uh, sell it for say 2 crore rupees they used to take 1.5 crore rupees in cash 50 lakh they used to uh, keep in um, uh, the the uh, check form a property worth 2 crore was being uh, actually on papers being shown at 50 lakh rupees so capital gain was also computed at a very very lesser price 50 lakh rupees because the consideration was given in cash to curb this problem to curb this problem income tax act said that the sales consideration which you are paying for your land and building 
will be compared with the stamp duty value stamp duty value is the value which is governed by law but which is governed by uh, the government so it will be compared with stamp duty value and if your sales consideration is much lower than the stamp duty value then we will assume that your sales consideration is the stamp duty value so if you have if you have the sales consideration of 50 lakh rupees we will assume that your sales consideration is 2 crores since the stamp duty value of that particular asset is 2 crores this is the provision which is section 50c let's read the section all right it says value of consideration in case of land building or both so what is the value of consideration in case of land building or both it is given in section 50c section 50c is the section which has the um a deemed value of consideration will deem the value of consideration so now the ask is if sdv is greater than the sales consideration sdv is stamp duty value if stamp duty value is greater than the actual sales consideration then what will happen if stamp duty value is greater than the actual sales consideration then what will happen and the second option is when stamp duty value is less than or equal to the sales consideration when stamp duty value is less than or equal to the sales consideration that is the option number 2 so if stamp duty value is less than or equal to the sales consideration then full value of consideration should be the actual sales consideration so guys if i'll give you an example if the value stamp duty value of the property is 15 lakhs and if you are actually selling it at if you are actually selling it at 17 lakhs your stamp duty value is 15 lakhs you are selling this property as 17 lakhs so your stamp duty value is low your actual sales consideration is higher government has no problems in it government is very very happy you are doing a beautiful task you are doing a very very good thing if your stamp duty value is less and your actual consideration is high government is very very happy government is saying okay nothing doing you please take your actual sales consideration as the full value of consideration for the purposes of capital gains i have no problems in it so government of india is very very happy when your stamp duty value is less than your sales consideration which means you are actually fetching right amount of sales consideration you are not undervaluing your property so this situation in this situation um uh, the fair value of consideration will be the sales consideration the actual sales consideration but government has a problem government has a problem in case in case your stamp duty value is greater than your sales consideration your stamp duty value is 25 lakhs and you are actually selling that property at 15 lakhs government has a problem in it government has a problem in it government is saying a thing worth 25 lakhs you are selling it for 15 lakhs unfair there is some forgery that you are doing there is some fraud which you are doing so government of india is saying that if your sdv stamp duty value is greater than sales consideration then we will analyze some further okay what is the uh, further analysis if stamp duty value is greater than 110% of the sales consideration if stamp duty value is greater than 110% of the sales consideration so if sales consideration is 100 and your stamp duty value is 112 then you fall under this category then your fair value of consideration will be the stamp duty value we will not take the actual sales consideration we will ignore the actual sales consideration i will and we will assume that your stamp duty value is the fair value of consideration we will assume that as a penalty because you are selling your property at a very very lower rate as compared to standard stamp duty value however in case your stamp duty value is less than or equal to 110% of uh, uh, actual sales consideration if your stamp duty value is less than or equal to 110% of uh, uh, actual sales consideration then we will consider your actual sales consideration as your fair value of consideration then we have no problems with it but if your stamp duty value is even more than 110% of actual sales consideration so your actual sales consideration is 100 and the value of the uh, stamp duty value of the property is 120 it is more than 10% of the actual sales consideration we will say you are doing some fraud with government of india you please take stamp duty value as your value of property that is what we are going to assume this is section 50c one of the most important sections of your syllabus guys this is really really um uh, important for you to understand this particular section but an easy one guys an easy one not a very difficult one 
And finally, we come to the last slide of this particular chapter, guys. Last slide, last thing that we are going to do is tax rates. What are the various tax rates which are uh, there in case of capital gains? The tax rates which are there in case of capital gains. Okay, tax rates on capital gain. Tax rates on capital gain. So, what are the tax rates which are applicable on capital gain? Long term capital gain, short term capital gain. I have um, edged all the capital gain rates in this particular chart. It's a very, very useful chart. Guys, in short, you will be able to revise the entire tax, uh, tax rates of capital gains using this particular chart. It will come really handy for you to compute the, to learn the tax rates of capital gains. All right. So I've divided this chart into two parts, short term capital gain and long term capital gain. Section 111A, 112A, long term capital gain, short term capital gain. Now, short term capital gain can be divided into two parts. Number one, short term capital gain where securities transaction tax has been paid or the transfer is done in foreign currency in a recognized stock exchange located in International Financial Services Center. This is a center which has been allocated by government of India for um, you know establishing uh, back, back offices of foreign companies in India. So if your transaction of short-term capital gain is such that you have paid the securities transaction tax on this particular transaction or the transfer is done in a foreign currency in a recognized stock exchange located in IFSC, then guys, your tax rate will be 15% plus plus. What is plus plus? Plus plus means surcharge and education sets will be added if you are eligible for it. So your uh, uh, securities transaction tax paid or transaction which are there in foreign currency, they are eligible for 15% tax rate on short-term capital gain. If, if, Yes, Bhavin is absolutely right. 110 has been recently amended. Earlier it was 105%. Bhavin is absolutely right. Okay. Then in any other case, if you are any other short term capital gain arises, then the usual rates will be applicable to you. Usual rates means usual rates will depend on your um, uh, nature of your uh, person. If you are individual, then the slab rates. If you are company, then 25% or 30% 30, 30 as the case may be. Uh, if you are a partnership firm, then the respective tax rates. So respective tax rates will be applicable to you. The usual tax rates will be applicable to you if you're not falling under these two categories. Second, long-term capital gains. And yes, long-term capital gains is generally taxable at a beneficial tax rate, at a lesser tax rate than short-term capital gain. Okay. So again, divided into two parts. First is security. Security means the financial instruments like shares, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, financial securities of a particular company, securities, <clears throat> then others, okay? Now, securities, which are specified securities. What are specified securities? Specified security means securities which are STD paid or securities which are transferred in foreign currency in a recognized stock exchange located in IFSC or securities which are like zero coupon bond or unlisted security sold by a non-resident. Guys, if, this, if you have specified security, then these specified security are taxable at the rate of 10% without indexation. They are taxable at the rate of 10%. These securities are taxable at the rate of 10% uh, uh, without taxation is for others. For other kind of securities, other than these securities, we have two options with indexation and without indexation. In case you are opting out of indexation, then we will offer you a tax rate of 10%. If you are opting for within indexation, then we will offer you a tax rate of 20%. So there are two categories. First of all, specified securities and other securities. Specified securities are taxable at the rate of 10%. Other securities are taxable further at two options. First is without indexation. Second is within indexation. Without indexation, the tax rate will be 10%. With indexation, the tax rate will be 20%. And if you have any other long-term capital gain apart from securities, land and building, any kind of other asset, anything apart from land and uh, apart from securities, then guys, it will totally, totally be taxed at the rate of 20%. Plus, plus means plus surcharge and plus education says that is the tax rate. So guys, you need to understand and you, to, you need to apply these tax rates well. And yes, please note that no tax is there up to 1 lakh rupees of uh, long-term capital gain if they arise from these categories. No uh, tax is there up to 1 lakh rupees. That is the uh, uh, important part. 
ओके ओके सर सो गाइस दीज वर द टैक्स रेट्स प्रोविजंस ऑफ लॉन्ग टर्म एंड शॉर्ट टर्म कैपिटल Yes. Okay. So, guys, by this I complete the revision of capital gains chapter. Capital gains chapter, one of the most important chapters of your syllabus. And yes, one thing I have left from this revision series is exemptions under section fifty-four. Exemptions or deductions under section fifty-four that I have deliberately left because uh, those are simple one, guys. Um, those are just uh, based on. the conditions which are there there's nothing to um, make you understand uh, in those exemptions but that you have to do yourself they are very very important deduction under section 54 that you need to do complete yourself all right so capital gain um complete revision is over so the coming sunday sunday which is there sunday which is 8th of may okay sunday which is 8th of may 8th of may 2020 you have a test of capital gains part 2 you have a test of capital gains part 2 7 pm so be prepared for that test guys and this thursday there is no live session of dt so live session of dt happens on tuesdays and thursday so today is tuesday um uh, thursday's live session is cancelled uh, thursday we'll have no live session now we will directly meet on sunday for the test at 7 pm and the test which is scheduled is of capital gain part 2 and yes i'll be sharing all these ppts to you over the whatsapp group so all these ppts will be available with you to um, uh, get to the uh, to the solution and get to these um, uh, provisions very very quickly and please note how to uh, uh, join the whatsapp group 9643929913 is the mobile number on which you have to message and you'll be part of the whatsapp group and join that whatsapp group for any update for any kind of uh, pdfs and um, any kind of test information everything will be imparted to you on this particular whatsapp group all right so we'll be meeting on the test date which is 8th of may now no live session on this thursday there's no live session on thursday we'll directly meet for the test on 8th of may yes till the time we meet again happy eid once more happy akshay tritiya all the very best and happy studying bye bye See you on Earth.